Good morning. Our first item today is general questions, and we start with number one from Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to promote Scotland's reputation overseas as that of a welcoming and tolerant society. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hisnop. The Scottish Government is committed to fostering Scotland's reputation for being a warm and open country. Our international framework is underpinned by a commitment to good global citizenship and we can continue to promote our core values, including the respect of international human rights standards in all our international engagement. Scotland is now is the new collective approach for the Scottish Government and partner agencies to market Scotland to the world as a progressive and welcoming nation. Scotland is now reaches out internationally to encourage people to be part of Scotland's future, to live, to work, study, visit and do business here. Gillian Martin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I can't have been alone in having conversations with constituents concerned at images of far-right factions appearing at EU exit demonstrations in London, seemingly emboldened by political events and led by characters taking advantage of the situation to spread messages that one can only hope never become associated with the vast majority of us in the eyes of those watching from overseas. Can the Cabinet Secretary give an idea of what steps the Scottish Government has gone to to engage with EU nationals and new Scots living in Scotland to reassure them that they are valued, respected, and that racism and xenophobia have no place in their society? And what engagement has it had with the UK Government Home Office in putting forward the view that Scotland should continue to be a destination of choice for those who want to contribute to our society? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member raises hugely important issues of our time. Uh, the only way to tackle racism and xenophobia is to tackle it head on, and that requires political leadership, and that requires, I think, everyone to step up to the mark. Sadly, that in certain parts of the United Kingdom, that's been sadly lacking. Uh, and in terms of our engagement with EU nationals, we've been engaging with uh, EU citizens uh, for some time in terms of giving reassurance to them. Uh, only this week, we announced our service to help support in relation to settled status and yesterday the parliament agreed that the settled status fee fees should be abolished because the cultural and the economic value of our EU citizens should not be put on the price of a settled fee status. But presiding officer, I cannot have been the only person to have looked at the white paper produced by the UK Home Office and our migration minister. I spoke to Caroline Noakes, the minister there, only yesterday. This is no way for Scotland to have a future governed by a government that produces such such a white paper. Their proposal to have 85% potential reduction on EEA citizens living in Scotland would be absolutely catastrophic for our economies and the diversity and the distribution of the communities in our remote rural areas, let alone our tourism, our hospitality and other sectors. But, presiding officer, even worse than the economic effect is what does this say about the country that the UK has become? Scotland cannot be part of a system that perpetuates that kind of attitude to those that want to come here. Scotland wants to welcome people because we value them and that's the message that this government will continue to put out. Question number two, Linda Fabiani. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government how it has evaluated the pilot and schools of its equally safe programme. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President officer, we're pleased to be working with Rape Crisis Scotland and Zero Tolerance to take forward Equally Safe at School, which aims to promote a whole school approach to tackling gender-based violence. Last year it was delivered in two secondary schools, including St John Ogilvie and Calder Glen, which is in the member's constituency, and it has been delivered in a further two schools this year. The project is in the second year of a three-year pilot and the University of Glasgow are currently undertaking a formative evaluation of it. Further work is ongoing with a view to a full-scale evaluation to progress, commencing, to progress commencing next year. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is very aware uh, of the work um, that has been carried out by various young women's organisations, including Young Women Lead, about sexual harassment in schools. Um, a concern I have is that we don't have what I believe is called intersectionality amongst public agencies uh, when dealing with such things. Can the Cabinet Secretary uh, confirm that there is discussion going on amongst agencies, schools, government, local government, the police, health service, for example, to make sure that we really can be equally safe in schools? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I would want to give Linda Fabi, Fabiani that reassurance. Uh, it is important that in all areas of government we take seriously the issues that are raised by the Young Women Lead Committee's report and other reports on the question of sexual harassment in schools. Uh, I had the opportunity to provide evidence to the um, equal the, the Human Rights Committee in Parliament, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee in Parliament just last week in relation to the evidence and the report of the Young Women Lead Committee, indeed to follow representatives of that committee. It is a powerful and deeply uncomfortable testimony that those young women have produced in this report and in their evidence to Parliament. And I'm committed to making sure that in all aspects of the government's work, whether it's in my core policy responsibilities in relation to education, where we've seen significant progress with the gender-based violence work being rolled out uh, in relation to the, um, the Emily Drury campaign, which uh, Fiona Drury has taken forward and which has been embraced by our universities and colleges to make sure that's replicated in schools, particularly through the work that we take forward on relationships, sexual health and parenthood education. Uh, and of course, to making sure more widely in government that all uh, areas of government are taking this message seriously. Question number three, Claire Baker. Apologies, President Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking in response to the antisocial or illegal use of quad bikes or similar vehicles. Minister Ashton. I'm well aware of the risk to public safety caused by careless, inconsiderate and antisocial driving which is why I fully support Police Scotland and its partners to deal with the misuse of vehicles in an appropriate and a proportionate way. I believe that local policing teams are ideally placed to engage with members of the community to identify where the misuse of vehicles is causing distress to the public. This ensures that these areas can be prioritised for proactive action to prevent future instances and identify and deal with those engaged in the misuse of vehicles. Clear Baker. Uh, the Minister may be aware that Fife, particularly the Leave and Mouth area, continues to experience antisocial behaviour despite the best efforts of local police, and this is continuing to put at risk a serious or even fatal accident. The local police inspector has called for more powers to tackle this menace, a call which I back. Will the Minister agree to meet with me in the new year to discuss how we can support our local police and ensure they have the appropriate powers to take the necessary action? Minister. Um, I thank the member for raising that issue. Um, I am aware of this. I would be certainly be happy to meet with the member to discuss it. Um, the Antisocial Behaviour Scotland Act of 2004 does provide a wide range of measures for dealing with all forms of antisocial behaviour. And our national strategy is based on prevention, early intervention and diversionary activities. The Scottish Government is currently working with a group of local authorities to use their expertise and knowledge to inform, refresh and update all of our guidance documents on tackling antisocial behaviour. Thank you. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in reducing youth unemployment in North Ayrshire. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, youth unemployment for 16 to 24 year olds in North Ayrshire in the October 2016 to September 2017 period was down 13.8% from its peak in the post economic downturn period in the October 2011 to September 2012 period. Thank Kenneth you. Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Scottish Enterprises recently announced funding of £10 million to invest in infrastructure at Hunterston in my constituency. Can the Minister advise the Chamber as to how many jobs this will help to create and how many apprenticeships it will secure for young people in North Ayrshire? Jamie Hepburn. It will, uh, of course, uh, I'm aware of the uh, investment that has uh, been provided to support the, the transformation of Scotland's energy uh, sector, as well as providing significant opportunities for uh, the North Ayrshire uh, economy. Skills Development Scotland has been working closely uh, with Scottish Enterprise and uh, Peel Ports. We'll be undertaking work to explore the potential or job opportunities and the, the skills demands that will be required. I understand there will be around 40 apprenticeship opportunities and of course through Skills Development Scotland we'll be very delighted to support those opportunities for North Ayrshire's young people. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. A recent report published this month by the Health Foundation looked at some of the challenges facing young people right across the UK. One of the locations they, cho uh, they chose was North Ayrshire. And looking through the feedback from young people re responded, uh, some of the comments were that they had a perception that opportunities were scarce and that they may have to move elsewhere. So notwithstanding the very good work that is going on, what does the Minister think we could all do to help promote some of these excellent opportunities? Minister. It will... Uh, let me say, when I go around the country and uh, Ayrshire and North Ayrshire will be no different. One of the big challenges we do have is that there are a range of opportunities on 
young people's doorsteps. They're just not always aware of those opportunities. And that's a critical element of our de developing the young workforce strategy. And it's to make young people aware of those opportunities. And I would urge every member, including Mr Green, uh, to make sure that young people are aware of the Developing Young Workforce Initiative. And Ruth Maguire. Thank you. With hundreds of jobs and £350 million worth of investment at, at stake, does the Minister agree that it's time for the UK Government to stop dragging its heels on the Ayrshire Growth Deal and join the Scottish Government and local authorities signing heads of terms on the 25th of January to bring these much-needed jobs and investment to Ayrshire? Minister. It, well, we are committed to supporting the Ayrshire economy through uh, a growth deal. The Ayrshire local authorities have indicated that they want to sign uh, heads of terms for a deal on the 25th. Of January, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport and Innovation and Connectivity has responded to he is willing to do so. He's written to the Secretary of State uh, for Scotland to urge the UK Government to agree to this timescale. Uh, thus far, we await a reply. And question number five, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve support for women who have lipoedema. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish Government recognises that lipoedema uh, can be a distressing and painful condition. As with all long-term conditions, we want people living with lipoedema to be able to access the best possible care and support. Lipoedema services are mainly provided by therapists, including nurses and allied health professionals who are based in lymphoedema services available in every health board in Scotland. Over the last three years, we've worked to improve lymph lymphoedema services via the National Lymphoedema Care in Scotland Working Group. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for his reply. Anne Henry, who I've been working with for over a year now, went public about how difficult it is to get a diagnosis for lipoedema on the NHS. Following a private diagnosis, Anne has faced a battle to get NHS treatment. There is only one surgeon in the NHS in Scotland who can perform the surgery she needs. Anne was due to have surgery in Nine Wells Hospital next month, but she's been told to expect a delay because of staff capacity issues. Last month, the Minister made a call. He told me there is no demand for a second surgeon. But SPICE advised that over a quarter of a million women in Scotland have lipoedema. Can the Minister explain why one surgeon is sufficient? Will he look at the capacity issues again? And will he meet with me in the new year to discuss ways to improve lipoedema health care? Minister. Obviously, I, I, I was pleased to hear that the, the, the member's constituent um, has, has got an appointment uh, going forward. I hope that, that takes place in a timorous manner. Um, liposuction is not, not necessarily the best um, and appropriate treatment for everyone with lipoedema. Um, so while there, there are the numbers that the, the member suggested in terms of people with lipoedema, that doesn't mean to say that number of people that is the best treatment. And clearly that's a discussion between the clinician and the patient to decide what the best treatment uh, is for. Dr Alex... Monarch is, is the leading uh, surgeon who performs this specialist treatment, performs it in Dundee, and I think there is a real danger that if we had more surgeons performing them, that particular surgery, then they wouldn't be able to um, maintain their skill sets in terms of the, the terms, uh, the, the, the demand um, for, for that service. And that would be something that, I think that, that would really um, send alarm bells ringing for me if, if we were potentially um, having a, a number of surgeons who weren't managing to keep their skill set up to date. But of course, I'm happy to meet with the member to discuss these matters in the new year. Question number six, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what proportion of freight is conveyed by rail? Cabinet Secretary Michael Madison. Uh, Network Rail advised that there are currently around 45 freight trains a day in Scotland. The latest figures available show that the proportion of freight conveyed by rail relate to 2012-13, when the percentage was 4.3%. We do not have a more up-to-date figure because, although Transport Scotland continues to request information, one large freight operator, for commercial reasons, will not release its volume data. We are seeking to have this matter resolved. John Finney. Um, I thank you. Cabinet Secretary for that reply. The Cabinet Secretary would be a frustration, so there are connected with any trying to improvements with uh, uh, conveying uh, freight by rail, and I include the Highland Spring. Uh, and the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that we support the devolution of network rail. The reopening of the Leavenmouth link and the duelling of the Highland Main Line would dramatically increase uh, the potential for freight to be moved from road to rail. Will the Cabinet Secretary progress those projects in the 2019 2024 control period? Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, sign officer, the member made reference to a number of projects, in particular the one in Highland Spring. He'll be aware that work has actually started on providing uh, a link at Highland Spring to allow them to move from uh, road to rail, uh, which will support their ambitions for uh, freight investment. Uh, there also, the member will be interested in the work that's been undertaken on the, uh, on the uh, Northern Line, which is about helping to provide uh, greater access for freight, along with greater resilience for passenger services. Uh, one of the areas of work that we will be giving a greater focus on in the next control period is uh, further enhancements to the infrastructure of Scotland's rail network, uh, including that um, providing greater provision for the ability to have a higher level of freight uh, on our rails in Scotland. Thank you. Question number seven, Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many integration joint boards have projected an overspend for 2018-19. Member Secretary Jean Freeman. Before taking into account uh, mitigating actions by the partnerships, the latest position indicates 22 integration authorities projecting an overspend. Management in terms of mitigating actions includes planned additional funding from partners, delivery of financial recovery plans and appropriate use of reserves. Uh, taking these into account, I expect integration authorities to deliver a balanced financial outturn, in part because, as a key comparison, last year at the end of December, integration authorities were forecasting a combined £71 million overspend. However, by the end of the financial year, they reported a £39 million underspend in their combined final, final accounts. Alex Rowley. Thank you for, for that answer. I think the Cabinet Secretary, if she looks at the detail of that, many of those uh, IGBs that, that were projecting overspends did overspend and the local authorities came along and used balances to be able to bail them out. The fact is that the IGBs right across Scotland are in crisis. The Accounts Commission report two weeks ago stated that the majority of IGBs have underlying financial sustainability issues. Uh, and the reality is, if I can talk about Fife, I believe Fife IGB was set up to fail because it was set up with a deficit. It started off its work in life with a deficit. Will she agree to start to have discussions with NHS Fife and Fife Council and look at putting the health and social care partnership onto a proper financial stability moving forward? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Rowley for that answer. Um, do you know, at the end of March, uh, our combined integration joint boards were sitting with £124 and a quarter million pounds of reserves. These are part of the mitigating actions that I am discussing. Of course, this is a joint venture between local authorities and health boards. And whilst Mr Rowley may be correct that in terms of the last financial year, local authorities provided additional funds, so too did health boards. And much of that came from our overall health budget and the transfer to local government that is in both the settlement and in the uh, health uh, settlement itself. That is the case currently again, yet again, for this year's draft budget. So we need to be really clear and careful here about how we talk about the funding of our integrated joint boards and how that money is managed. And part of the discussion that I have had very helpfully with my counterpart in COSLA, Councillor Curry, is to look in January at a number of matters around the funding and resourcing of integrated uh, joint boards, not least those reserves, which are not new and have increased from the year before. Mr Rowley and I have already discussed uh, the Fife IJB, of course, uh, that uh, deficit that they started with came from both the local authority and the health board, and we do need to assist in that particular instance, I believe, that particular IJB who started off in a poor footing and needs some joint assistance uh, from us in order to help them move forward. And again, Councillor Curry and I have already had an initial discussion on that, and we will continue that in the early part of next year. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Edinburgh's integrated joint board is set to be £10.3 million over budget. Um, they're looking to use £1.3 million of their reserve to reduce that deficit. It's clear this Parliament needs to have more financial accountability over the integrated joint boards. So can I ask, what in the new year will there be the Cabinet Secretary be bringing forward to make sure we can achieve that, like we have with health boards? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, if, if um, Mr Briggs is referring to the three-year funding plan, 
uh, that I announced uh, for health boards. Then he will, of course, also be aware in terms of the IJBs that they have the capacity to hold reserves. Indeed, I've just been talking about the amount of money that they do have, and Edinburgh is sitting with just over £8 million at this point. Uh, but Mr. Mr Briggs will also know that I have, I, I hope, uh, that he is now in receipt of this, replied in detail to the detailed pre-budget scrutiny from the Health and Sport Committee, much of which talks about the, the financing and the governance of the IJBs. And in January, I'll have the pleasure of being before that committee to give evidence and discuss those matters further. And I certainly look forward to doing that. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions.